pleasure that I present to you Dr. Carl Sagan. Thank you, Chancellor Weir. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I recently uh, had to watch all 13 episodes of Cosmos. Uh, we're putting together the uh, videotape version of that. I never said it. <laughs> I said, there's hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. I said, there's billions of trillions of stars in the universe. I never said billions and billions. Johnny Carson said it, but not me. It's too imprecise. Billions and billions. It's very vague. It's sort of... I'm very happy to be here with you celebrating this rite of passage, and I want to wish you all the very best of luck at a key and critical time in human history. For myself, I, uh, when I graduated college, I never had any intention of being involved in, in public or political issues. I, I just wanted to, uh, to explore the planets, see what they were like. You'd think that there was nothing so remote from uh, earthly concerns as the planets and the stars. And it's been my good fortune, as Chancellor Weir briefly mentioned, to have participated in a stunning set of spacecraft exploratory ventures which have taken us, our robots, and by extension ourselves, to explore the entire solar system. Last August, the Voyager 2 spacecraft passed through the Neptune system, and except for the single small planet Pluto, the human species has, in uh, the last 30 years, explored all the planets of the solar system. There's only one time when that is accomplished, and we are fortunate enough to be alive in that time. Among my interests, in spacecraft exploration of the planets is the very natural interest in the possibility of life elsewhere. We have explored dozens of worlds, if you count the moons of the planets. We've found much that is instructive, an enormous amount that was unexpected. We have seen glorious landscapes, but we do not have the faintest hint of the presence of life elsewhere. There are the stirrings and intimations in many worlds where organic matter is assembling itself, but not a hint of life. And so, after that experience, it's very natural to look with new eyes at our own planet, the Earth, and to recognize how extraordinary it is, a world graced by life. And the conclusion seems to be that you can have many worlds, dozens of worlds, and life on only one of them. It underscores the scarcity, the preciousness of life. It seems to call to us to work to preserve and cherish this remarkable phenomenon that we are so deeply part of. And another activity in space uh, for me underscored this lesson, and that was the succession of pictures, but especially the earliest Apollo pictures of the whole Earth. You take a look at those pictures and you see this exquisite blue and white world set like a jewel 
against the velvet blackness of space. And the, the thought that uh, arises unbidden, I think, in every astronaut who has seen it and every one of us who has seen the pictures is, again, about the delicacy, the fragility, the vulnerability of the Earth. And what strikes me especially is if you look closely, there's a thin blue aura that surrounds the Earth on its daylit hemisphere, and that's just the atmosphere. Its thinness is what is so striking. The thickness of the atmosphere compared to the size of the Earth is roughly the same as the thickness of the coat of shellac compared to the size of a uh, library globe of the Earth. There isn't much air. Now, when our numbers were few and our technology feeble, it was impossible to imagine that uh, we humans could affect the life-sustaining environment of our planet. But now that our numbers are enormous and our technology formidable, even awesome, the situation is different. And it is now clear that we are able, on purpose and even inadvertently, accidentally, to make disastrous changes in the life support system of our planet. For me, I've been led to three of these vulnerabilities precisely by examining other worlds. It turns out, it seems to me, that you can learn a great deal about your own world by studying others. So I was led to the discovery that my colleagues and I made of nuclear winter by studying dust storms on Mars. That was the first step in the long sequence of work that led us to discover this planet-wide climatic catastrophe that now is widely agreed uh, as a possible consequence of a global nuclear war. Also on Mars, there is no ozone, or very little. And the ultraviolet light from the sun can strike the surface of that planet unimpeded. And when we landed there in 1976 with the two Viking landers, we found a strangely antiseptic surface. Not only no sign of microorganisms, no sign of bigger organisms, I mean, not a blade of grass, not a microbe, but not even an organic molecule. And our understanding of that is that the ultraviolet light from the sun has sterilized the surface of Mars. And Venus is a world with a massive greenhouse effect produced largely by carbon dioxide and water vapor, so hot that the surface is at 900 Fahrenheit, hotter than the hottest household oven, hot enough to melt tin or lead. Now, I'm not saying that there used to be a species of Venusians who drove fuel-inefficient automobiles. That's, that's not my argument. But I say that each of these three serious, real, or potential assaults on the Earth's atmosphere have analogs, have warning signs on other planets. There is a delicate balance of invisible gases on which we depend. And it is our job to make sure that that subtle, delicate, life-supporting environment is maintained. And incidentally, since these are invisible gases, since these potential disasters are uh, in a very different category from a an invader from a foreign country, we must be able to understand science in order to assess and deal with these dangers. It's a very different kind 
of discipline that's required to face the new category of dangers. There are a set of changes that I think are clearly needed to deal with these dangers. On the nuclear war issue, it is absurd, it is obscene to have a world with 60, nearly 60,000 nuclear weapons in them, almost all of which are more powerful than the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when less than 1% of that number might bring on nuclear winter. If you are interested in the idea of deterrence, you can maintain that deterrence with a tiny fraction of the existing arsenals. Ozone depletion, we know exactly what the, what the principal agent is. It's a category of molecules called CFCs. The DuPont brand name is Freons. There is an international protocol to cut them in half by the turn of the century, that's not nearly good enough. We must simply remove those molecules from the face of the earth. And for greenhouse warming, there is a set of considerably more difficult steps that are required, including much greater efficiency in the use of fossil fuels, a vigorous research and development effort for alternatives to fossil fuels, especially solar power. And massive reforestation, since forests take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, growing forests do. Instead, our species is destroying an acre of forest every second on the Earth. Just think about that for a minute. And then finally, None of these steps will be useful, no matter how heroic they are, if we don't do something about the enormous growth in our numbers. The world population crisis is key to many other crises, and there is no likely solution to that without raising the standard of living of the poorest people on the planet. It seems to me, if we're concerned about preserving the environment, on which we depend, there is a clear and unfortunately urgent set of steps that have to be taken. Now, molecules don't have passports. Molecules are terrifically dumb. They do not understand the important idea of national boundaries and national sovereignty. You put CFCs or carbon dioxide up above one country, and the circulation of the Earth's atmosphere carries it all over the world. This new category of global environmental problem requires a trans-ideological, a transnational, a let's think about the unification of the world. We. Uh, Humans started out in East Africa a million years ago or so. We were one people. We spread all over the planet. We differentiated, especially culturally. And now, through technological advances, especially in transportation and communications, we are reacquainting ourselves with each other. The walls are falling down. There is a new partial union of the nations of Europe coming about in two years. Democracy, civil liberties, freedom of speech are suddenly fashionable. And I think this is just in time. These are essential tools for understanding the new world we are entering and helping us to figure out how to solve these serious problems. So I would like to urge you, I know this is a day in which everybody is telling you what you have to do, and uh, you certainly might uh, be tempted to listen politely and pay no attention. I urge you 
not to sit this one out. We cannot leave the solution of these problems to politicians and bureaucrats. We have had a lot of experience with them. The people have to take charge. For those of you who are, in the most serious sense, coming of age in this time, it seems to me there is a profound obligation to play a role in determining and safeguarding the human future. Your lever arm is long. Your potential influence is great because this is such a critical time in human history. You have an opportunity denied to other generations to make a world not only worthy of all of us and of the generations without whom we would not be here, but a world worthy of the children and grandchildren yet to come. There are many ways to be involved in these issues, and I urge you to become involved. I want to make just one last remark. I, uh, I talked about how exploring those other worlds gives a, an insight, a perspective, useful for judging our own. And I want to mention to you a set of pictures that has not yet been released that you will see in another month or so, sometime next month probably. When the Voyager 1 spacecraft left the planetary part of the solar system, we were able, turned out it wasn't easy, to get it to turn back and to photograph all the worlds it had left. And so we now have a portrait of the solar system in which we live. There's a background of distant stars. The planets are spread out on either side of the sun. The sun looks wonderfully like a child's drawing of it with rays coming out because of diffraction uh, produced by an obstacle on the spacecraft. And you look at those planets, and they're very small. Some are lost in the background of brighter, more distant stars. And then you look for the Earth, and you can find it. It's not very bright, not very big. It's one pixel, one picture element. It's a blue dot. That's where we live. Our home is a blue dot. I ask you to cherish that blue dot. It's the only home we have. Thank you and good luck. Thank you very much, Dr. Sagan. It is very unusual at a commencement exercise or any other event for that matter to have both a somber and yet uplifting and a cosmic view of our future. The combined choruses will now sing fanfare for a festival. This will be followed by the Varsity Men's Glee Club, who will sing the state song, Illinois.
By thy rivers gently flowing, Illinois, Illinois. By thy prairies verdant growing, Illinois, Illinois. Comes an echo on the breeze, rustling through the leafy trees. And its mellow tones are these, Illinois, Illinois. And its mellow tones are these, I am pleased to present to you Mrs. Jane Hayes Rader of the class of 1954. Mrs. Rader is the president of the University of Illinois Alumni Association. She will bring greetings from the association and will announce the recipients of Alumni Association Awards. Mrs. Rader. Thank you. As president of the country's largest alumni association, 117,000, and you are all members, free for one year. <laughs> Welcome to our world. Sometimes when I'm passing time in a waiting room, or a less than interesting meeting, or at a stoplight when I'm already late, I look down at this watch that I wear, and it just happens to have the seal of the University of Illinois on it. It says something about chartered in 1867, and it has at the top the motto, learning and labor. You can identify with that. Think back over your four or six or eight, or you know how many years, there's been a lot of learning and labor. And I hope that there's been a large amount of laughter and love. I can only wish for you 
a continuance of all four of those life elements for all the rest of your days. With extraordinary pleasure that I present to you Dr. Carl Sagan. Thanks very much, Chancellor Weir. Um, I, I have to say that um, I recently had the opportunity to uh, view all the episodes of Cosmos because we were uh, putting together the video cassette version, which is now available. And uh, I never once said that phrase. <laughs> I mean, I said that there are hundreds of billions of stars in the galaxy. I said that there are billions of trillions of stars in the universe. But I never once said billions and billions. It's too um, imprecise. <laughs> it's, it's very vague. Scientists would never say billions and billions. But uh, I'm glad if it's helped to get uh, large numbers into the public consciousness. I'm very happy to be here with you to help you celebrate this important day, this rite of passage. And uh, I think this is happening at an absolutely critical time in human history. I remember very well my, my own graduation and how much it meant to me. I had no conception, no idea of being involved in in any political or social or environmental issues in those days. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. This was before Sputnik. I wanted to explore the planets and find out what they were like. You'd think nothing was more remote from earthly concerns than exploring the planets and the stars. It's been my enormous good fortune to be alive at just that moment when the spaceships of Earth went out to explore the solar system, and we have now sent our robotic emissaries to all of the planets, from Mercury out to Neptune, only the distant outpost of the solar system, Pluto, remains unexplored. And one of my principal interests in that exploration, I think it's a very natural and human interest, was to see if there were any signs of life elsewhere. Well, we've explored many dozens of worlds, if you include the moons as well as the planets. We have seen magnificent landscapes. We have learned an enormous amount of information. But there is not a hint of anything alive. We've not landed on most of those worlds. There may be something living that uh, we haven't been smart enough to detect yet, but at least as far as we know, there is no life on any of those worlds. You can have dozens of worlds and have life on only one of them. And so it seems natural to me after this 25-year period of exploration that I've been involved in to uh, turn my attention back to this world, the only one we know that is graced by life. Those are the worlds, some of them, represent alternative pathways in the evolution of Earth-like planets. They are cautionary tales about what can go wrong 
on a world like ours. And I'll say in a moment some examples about it, but it turns out very unexpectedly that a good way, an important way, a possibly unique way to understand our world is to go out and explore others. There's another way in which spacecraft have enhanced our appreciation of this world, and that is they have provided the first pictures of the whole Earth. And uh, most striking were the first such pictures, the color photos of the Earth taken by the Apollo astronauts on their voyages to the moon. And what we saw was a, a small, beautiful, blue and white, jewel-like world set against the velvet backdrop of space. And you look at those pictures and unbidden the, the thought arises that this is a fragile and vulnerable place. And if you look closely, you can see on the daylit hemisphere a kind of a corona, a kind of aura of blue. And that's just the scattering of sunlight off the atmosphere. And what is so striking about it, uh, many astronauts have, have uh, commented on it, is how thin it seems. Indeed, the, the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere compared to the diameter of the Earth is about the same as the thickness of the coat of shellac on a school globe compared to the diameter of the globe. There's hardly any air there. When we started out, we humans in uh, East Africa a million or two million years ago, our numbers were very small, our technological abilities extremely limited. The idea that we might influence the environment of the planet on which we depend could never have arisen in uh, the most prescient of our ancestors of that time. But today, today there are 5.3 billion of us, truly billions and billions. Our technology has reached formidable, indeed even awesome proportions, and today we are fully able to make catastrophic changes in the environment that sustains us, not only on purpose, but also inadvertently, accidentally. If we don't watch what we're doing, we can make great troubles for ourselves. There are three, there are many, but there are at least three extremely serious perils to this global environment. And every one of them, at least in my intellectual evolution, has uh, started by studying other planets. My colleagues and I were the first to find out about nuclear winter, the worldwide climate catastrophe that it is now widely acknowledged uh, is likely to follow a major nuclear war. But our pathway to that discovery started out when we tried to understand dust storms on the planet Mars. Mars also is interesting in another respect. It has virtually no ozone in its atmosphere. So the germicidal, the dangerous ultraviolet light from the sun falls unimpeded on its surface. When the two United States Viking spacecraft set down on Mars in uh, July and August of 1976, we were, among other things, looking for life. The cameras found nothing large enough to see, not even a blade of grass. The three microbiology experiments found, as far as we can tell, no compelling evidence for microbes 
and an additional experiment could not even find any organic matter on Mars, even though organic matter falls on Mars from meteorites. The surface of Mars is antiseptic, and the prevailing wisdom is that the reason for that is the ultraviolet light that uh, penetrates to the surface because there is no ozone layer there. A lesson for us who are putting in peril our own ozone layer. And the third such global catastrophe that is within our power to create has to do with the increasing greenhouse effect. The planet Venus is a clear example of the extremes to which an Earth-like planet can be taken by having too much of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The surface of Venus is at a temperature of 900 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than the hottest household oven, hot enough to melt tin and lead. Now, I'm not suggesting that, um, that there were once a species of Venusians who drove fuel-inefficient automobiles, and that's why Venus is in trouble. But it's a very important object lesson that a world like the Earth can be driven to such a disastrous, inclement climate by the greenhouse effect. Now, notice that all three of these catastrophes are connected with a delicate balance of invisible gases. It's not as if some, uh, some slavering conqueror came to attack us, in which case it's very easy to visualize who the enemy is and what to do. This is much more subtle. And to understand these problems and to take appropriate countervailing action, we must understand science and technology. It's essential that science and technology be something with which everyone is comfortable especially the 535 members of the House of Representatives and the Senate. <laughs> Something like three of them have any background in science. Now, the changes that are needed to approach these problems <clears throat> I think are, are quite straightforward. On the nuclear war issue, it is outrageous, it's obscene that we humans, but mainly the United States and the Soviet Union, have 60,000 nuclear weapons, almost all of which are more powerful than the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when less than 1% of that number is adequate to produce a nuclear winter. It's absurd. We don't need it. If we like the posture of strategic deterrence, we can maintain that posture with much lower arsenals. And uh, therefore, that's one thing we clearly ought to do, and this goes far beyond start. Secondly, on ozone depletion, we know what the responsible agent is. It's a set of molecules called chlorofluorocarbons, or the DuPont brand name is Freons. There is a so-called Montreal Protocol that many nations have signed to phase these molecules out to half by the year 2000. Half is not nearly enough, and the United States ought to be taking the lead in much swifter reductions of these materials to zero. And the third, and in a way most troubling problem, troubling because the solutions, the long-term solutions are more difficult, is greenhouse warming. What we should do there is a major program for much higher efficiency in the use of fossil fuels, we ought to have 
a major federally sponsored research and development program for alternatives to fossil fuels, of which solar power is clearly the optimum. We ought to be worldwide planting of forests when instead the human species is destroying one acre of forest every second, every second. And then finally, we must address in a serious way the population of the planet because even if we take heroic efforts to solve all those other problems, the more people, the more greenhouse gases, as well as many other potential problems, and the solution to the world population crisis is the economic well-being of the poorest people. We ought to be in favor of that. Now, there's an interesting character to these, uh, to these problems. Molecules don't have passports. Molecules are exceptionally stupid. They don't know about uh, sovereignty. They don't know about national boundaries. They just get blown by the wind. In fact, the wind is made of molecules. So if a C CO2 molecule or a CFC molecule is put into the atmosphere over one country, it is carried over other countries. No one nation can solve this problem. This is a global problem. And this then points out one of the, I think, most interesting and in the way most hopeful aspects of these problems. These are trans-ideological, trans-national, and trans-generational issues. We are all of us, this generation and future generations, and everybody on earth in this together. And this means that no matter where you come from, what your ideology is, you must now start being in favor of the unification of the planet. And And this is happening anyway. The, the advances in uh, transportation and communications technology, uh, these are revolutions which are binding up the earth. All you have to do is, is turn on CNN and see it happening. And it is true, the, there are walls falling down in, uh, in Europe. There is a remarkable partial unification of Europe happening not just the events in the newspapers today, but the European Economic Union that will take place in two years. And it is getting to be fashionable worldwide to be in favor of democracy, of civil liberties, of the freedom of speech. And it's clear that these are absolutely essential tools if we are going to understand and manage the new world that we are willy-nilly entering. So, you know it is common on occasions like this for commencement speakers to exhort you to do this or that. And uh, it is also customary for the graduates to tune the exhortation out. I would like to break through the tuning out, if you let me. Don't sit this issue out. It's too important. We can't leave this to the politicians and the bureaucrats. We know the quality of their response. In a time of increasing democracy, it is time for the people to take control. You are coming of age at a most critical moment in the history of the world, and you have an opportunity to play a critical role in determining and in safeguarding the human future. You have a long lever arm. 
your potential influence to affect the future is great. You have an opportunity more than most other generations to make a difference, to make a world worthy of you, of the generations of your ancestors who worked to put you here, and a world worthy of our and your children and grandchildren. I began by mentioning some of the ways in which our perspective about our little planet has been influenced by space vehicle exploration, and I'd like to close by mentioning one more. The Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft have now left the planetary part of the solar system. It's an astonishing accomplishment. Machines of the human species speeding out past the planets into the dark of interstellar space. We have accomplished that. And as Voyager 1 left the realm of the planets, we were able, it was not easy to do, for bureaucratic, not technical reasons, we were able to get it to turn around and to photograph the solar system from which it had come. These pictures have uh, not been released yet. They will be released by NASA, I think, in a few weeks. And uh, it's a portrait of where we are. And so there's the sun, and then arrayed out on either side of it are the planets. And then far behind them is a smattering of the brightest stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And so you can see the planets. Some of them are, are so dim that there's no way to tell whether it's a planet or a star just by looking. Others, like uh, Jupiter and Saturn, are brighter and easier to see. The Earth is there. You have to look close to see it. It's a single pixel, a single picture element across. It's a dot, a blue dot against the background spangle of the Milky Way galaxy. And I'd like to leave you with a mental image of that blue dot on which all of us and everyone we ever heard of has lived. That blue dot is worth cherishing because it is the only home we have. I wish you great good luck. Thank you very much. It is rare indeed for a commencement or any other celebration, for that matter, to have a speaker who touches of us so deeply, uh, both uplifting and somber, and yet a message of cosmic proportions. We certainly thank you, Dr. Sagan. The combined choruses now will sing Fanfare for a Festival. This will be followed by the Varsity Men's Glee Club, who will sing the state song, Illinois. Thank <laughs> you.
By thy rivers gently flowing, Illinois, Illinois. By thy prairies verdant growing, Illinois, Illinois. Comes an echo on the breeze, Rustling through the leafy trees, and its mellow tones are these. Illinois, Illinois, and its mellow tones are these. Illinois. I am pleased now to present to you Mrs. Jane Hayes Rader of the class of 1954. Mrs. Rader is the president of the University of Illinois Alumni Association. She will bring greetings from the association and will announce the recipients of Alumni Association awards. Mrs. Rader. Thank you. As president of the country's largest alumni association, 117,000, and you are all members, free for one year, welcome to our world. Sometimes when I'm passing time in a waiting room, or a less than exciting meeting, or at a stoplight when I'm already late, I look down at the watch I wear and on the face of that watch is the seal of the University of Illinois. It states, Chartered, 1867. It also states the motto, Learning and Labor. Now you can identify with that. Think back over your four or six or eight or you know how many years. There's been a lot of learning and labor. I hope that there's been a large amount of laughter and love to go along with that. 
And I wish for you a continuance of all four of those very essential life elements. Your alumni association cares about you. We want you to tell us about your results and we'll share them with your friends. And we want you to understand that from this day forward, your alma mater, the University of Illinois, needs your support in time, in interest, and in dollars when you can. We are a family, and you are one of us. You are an Illini forever.